last few weeks, let me think, uh, we have been talking just a couple of pages over about uh, from Matthew chapter 13 or, or might even have been Luke chapter 8. But uh, if, uh, if you had your Bible, just flip over there for a minute to um, Matthew chapter 13. And there, there we find the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower, you know, and it's about where Jesus gives the example. And, and probably, you know, I was thinking as he was talking about this, probably there was somebody off in the distance, maybe a farmer. And, uh, and they, were, they were seeding the field, they were sowing, you know. And, and, and what, what they did was they would have, a, have like a, they would have like a, a bag, a pouch, you know, went over the shoulder and was right here and full of seeds. And they would take a handful and they'd just throw it, you know, go everywhere. And so as Jesus was, was seeing this, he'd probably say, look, the, behold, you know, a sower went forth to sow. And as he sowed seeds, they fell here, they fell there. And, and, he, and he talked about, you know, all that that meant, you know, about the, about the cares, the riches, the concerns of the world coming up and choking out the seed. But he never said ever that the seed was bad. The seed had the complete genetic material necessary to do everything it was supposed to do. That's, that's a really curious thing, you know, in, in, the, in the conversation of what he's saying. I, uh, I, you know, I, I have often wondered about that, and, I, and I've mentioned that. I, I planted grapes, Concord grapes. You know, they're the ones that you have that, when we have communion, that's, those are made out of Concord grapes, the blue ones. And I've often, I, I planted some Concord grapes one time beside a, a big old apple tree. It was, a, it was a Macintosh apple tree in the Annapolis Valley in our first church in Middleton. And uh, they, same soil, right beside it. Same bees pollinated everything. The bees went back and forth. And I thought to myself, I thought, you know, if ever there's a way that, that, that maybe these Concord apples could taste like, like uh, or Concord grapes could taste like Macintosh apples. See, I'm already confused. I thought, you know, th this could be it. But, you know, when fall came and, I, and I, we took the fruit off, they didn't taste anything the same at all. And, and we all say, well, that makes sense. Don't be so stupid, Mark. You know, come on now, get, get your, give your head a shake. But they were growing out of the same stuff. They, were, they were, had all the same influence. They had all the same water, all the same climate, all the same sun, all the same clouds, all the same grass growing around, all the same fertilizer even. The only difference was, was that the seed that started each of them had its own specific genetic material and it determined, that seed determined what that fruit was going to be. And nothing about the climate or the water or the fertilizer or the ground or the place or anything about it or who tended it could change that. So a sower went forth to sow. And as he sowed, these seeds fell amongst different things. The seed took root. It was good seed, strong seed, real seed, rich seed. The genetic material was all there for it to be, it, it to be and accomplish all that it was intended to be. But some were choked out. Something else robbed the life that was supposed to go into the seed. Cares and troubles and traumas and worries. Sometimes there was outside influences. Birds would zoom down. You can read it and they would steal the seed off the path or the, or the seeds would land on the rock and the soil wasn't there. And then, then but he comes down and he says about the good seed that took root. Verse 23 of Matthew chapter 13. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. And he produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Someone said that in an acorn, there is a billion trees in one acorn. What do you think of that? You understand what I mean? In one acorn, you understand, Mark. In one acorn, there is a billion trees because that acorn will produce more acorns. And those acorns will produce more acorns. And those acorns will produce more acorns. So all the world can be populated from one acorn. So in that one acorn... There is a billion trees. 
So let's, uh, let's, let's turn over. Let's, let's, go one more. Let's, let's go one more trip over. Let's go over to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 there. And, uh, and let's, uh, Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> well, I'm going to read two verses here, verses 14 and 15. Luke chapter 8. It says there, verse 14, the seed that fell among thorns stands for something, stands for those who hear, but as they go their way, they are choked by life's worries, life's riches, and life's pleasures, and so they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. <coughs> same, same situation. Now, Jesus there in verse 11 says, you know, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you. So in this passage of the sower and the seed, there is a secret of the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> now, agriculture is something Jesus spoke a lot about. Did you know that? I suspect he spoke more about agriculture than almost anything. Right? I mean, you think of it. Faith is a grain of mustard seed. He, uh, you know, there was the, the situation with the, he went looking for figs on a fig tree, you know, and there's a lot of leaves, so it was out of season, and, and there, was a, there was an agricultural principle there that was taught through that. You know, he, he taught, you know, the sower and going forth to, 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 to sow, you know, there's, he talked about seasons, he talked about growth, he talked about reaping and sowing and harvest, he talked about good fruit versus bad fruit, he talked about vineyards, he talked about plants that don't produce, plants that do produce, he talked about, you know, you'll know the tree by its fruit, he talked a lot about agriculture, this is curious, eh? And it's, it seems that as he was talking about this, that there's a, there's a common theme that comes out, and the common theme that comes out is the seasons of life, right? The seasons of next month is October. Today's the September the 15th, for heaven's sakes. Leaves are starting to change. What did I just say? What, time, what day is it? 16th. It's the 16th, yeah. September. Yeah. Okay, I thought I said, what did I say? I said 15th. Well, maybe it should be. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something. There's 365 and a quarter days every year. So it could be. What's that? Might be the one. Is this leap year? Anybody know? I don't know. Let's not worry about it. We're off topic. We're going down a rabbit trail. I don't have a gun. Seasons. Time changes. Leaves change, grass grows, grass withers. You cut your grass, or sometime around the middle of August, it kind of slows down a little bit. And there is a life cycle. You know, the grass withers, the flower fades. You know, there's, there's those references all in the Bible. But, but in, in all of this, there is a time and there is a season. And as Jesus here is talking about the, the sower and the seed, he, he brings our minds to this. And, uh, and, and, it, and there's, there's this idea of, the seed maturing in the human life. And so as, as I was thinking about the secret of the kingdom that's, that's, that's listed in this, I, I, got, I got thinking, well, well, this is not just a, a random story of something. There's a truth here that you can grab onto and live effectively in the kingdom of God. Now, did you ever think of doing that? Did you ever think of <clears throat> now, that, now that I am embracing Christ, or maybe you're thinking about embracing Christ, or maybe you've been on the journey for a long time. Have you ever thought of what it means to be successful as a Christian? Have you ever thought what it means to be uh, successful when you, when, you get, when you get to the time of death? And you're, you're there, and the family's all gathered around, and someone bends down to you, and he says, Mom or Dad, what is success now? And success, I'll guarantee you, is not about money. 
Success, I'll guarantee you, is not about houses and lands. Success, I'll guarantee you, is not about toys and trinkets. Success in that moment is about what you will face in the next few seconds. What will that be? <clears throat> Hence, we read that passage as we began in Matthew chapter 9. Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. Behold, a sower went forth to sow. That was Jesus. The sower in Matthew at chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus went throughout all the villages, and as he went, he sowed the seed. He preached the message of the gospel. He healed the sickness. He healed the disease. He raised the dead and caused the blind to see. He sowed the seed. And so what happened then to the seed? How, what, how did this grow? What, what was the process? Where were the seasons? Who fertilized it? When did the rain come? What kind of climate surrounded it? The sower was sowing the seed. He noticed something in this, and something this is quite important. Verse 36 of Matthew chapter uh, 9 says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Yeah. Is that any different than today? I, I was traveling this week, went to a couple of different provinces to see folks and churches and people. I, I took note of the cars that passed me. I, you know, you, you, you see one Mercedes, that's kind of a shock. You see 10 in a row, you think, well, who just went by? You know, when you see uh, a couple of Audis going, you think, well, there goes a rich person. You know, I think, what, what you know, uh, or, or you see, uh, see a brand new trucks, you know, the, the top Ford truck, top truck in the world right there going by. You know, you think, ooh, I wonder where they're living at. I wonder what they're making. You know, or, 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 or you, you look at the homes, you know, and you, and you see wealth, seems like wealth. You know, you see, uh, you see uh, sports cars going. Of course, this wasn't a holiday weekend, was it? No. Something was going on on Friday, I think it was, and it must have been a car show because I saw this 56 Corvette convertible going yellow. Man, it was nice, I'm telling you what. And I thought, whew, you know, I wonder what that would have cost, you know, or, or maybe, maybe uh, there was a whole line of these old cars, new cars, and all, it was, it was nice. And I, and I, but but this, this passage kind of came to my mind, you know, and I thought, are people different today than they were back in Jesus' day? You know, Jesus, as he walks around and he, and he looks into, into people's lives and he, and he sees all these cars and he sees all these, all these, these houses and lands and well-landscaped yards and flowers and, and, and people look happy, you know. You, you say, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks, how are you doing? Well, you know they're not fine. You know there's trauma. You know there's trouble. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I mean, even, even like when, when really difficult times happen and you're there because it's a difficult time, the first thing out of most people's mouths when you say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm okay. Well, they're not okay. So why do we say we're okay? Why do we wear these masks? Why do we insulate ourselves with all this stuff? Is it so that somehow we're gonna protect ourselves from, from, a, from a season that's coming? from when our leaves fall off the tree and all the sap runs out of our legs? You know, is, is that what we're trying to protect ourselves from there? Is Jesus seeing the same thing when he sees the crowds? Does he have compassion on them? Because he sees what's really on the inside and what's really on the inside is that they're harassed and they're helpless. And it's kind of like the sheep without a shepherd. I, have no, I, don't know, I don't know anything about sheep, so I can't even make it up. Probably someone here knows something about sheep and you'd correct me afterwards. Hopefully it'd be afterwards. You know, for a long time, I, uh, I would recognize I have an adult body, but I feel like a kid on the inside and I hope nobody knows I have no idea what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? 
Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever, you ever feel like, you know, you look in the mirror and you think, who's the old guy looking out at me? Because I feel like a kid and you're facing things and I'm thinking, I have no sweet clue what I'm doing. I'm making it up as I go along. I'm doing my best. I'm going to be honest in everything. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to build the plans. I'm going to pray about it. But I don't have any, you know, I, I, I think about uh, Mr. Dress Up and his tickled trunk of treasures. I got no tickle trunk. I got no treasures. I got no little devices I can pull out of there and fix problems. I got none of that. But I do have the Lord. And so I don't really need a tickle trunk because he's got everything that I need. His anointing is sufficient for everything that comes along. I'm not the shepherd. I'm the sheep. I'm following the shepherd. He knows where the best food is. He knows where the best water is. He knows when I need to rest, and I need to rest. He knows all of these things. I don't have to know it, and I can admit I don't know it. I can admit that sometimes I make mistakes and I don't have all the answers. I can admit that because he does have all the answers and he does know what's best and I just want to follow him. That's what it is to be in the kingdom. Well, you know, people sometimes say, well, I'm going to do it my own way. By and by, I get the opportunity to ask my favorite phrase, how's that working out for you? <laughs> Not so good. John chapter 12, there's another passage of scripture. Let's flip over that kind of real quick. John chapter 12, there's something struck me here the other day. <clears throat> Verse 23. Oh, uh, let's see here. Now, here it is. Verse 23 uh, down to uh, verse 26. Maybe, maybe we'll go to verse 28 just to kind of get the last bit of, the, of it there. Verse 23, John 12, verse 23. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Listen here. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me for this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This, uh, <clears throat> this verse is about where Jesus in, is in the garden of Gethsemane, I believe. And he's, he's praying there and he's, uh, and he's uh, talking with God. But, but he, he draws our attention to the same idea of the seed. And the seed in the hopper, the seed in the uh, granary, the seed in the, in the cedar, in the cedar bag, you know, as the, as the sower goes out, you know. Do you ever, do you ever um, kind of attribute human personality to inanimate objects, you know? Like, like they do in the cartoons, you know? You got the one little seed in there, and he's dodging the hand as it comes into the bag all the time. And you can see this in, in my mind. I know it's a little weird, but in my mind... You know, you can see that the seed is scurrying to the bottom because the hand is grabbing another one and throwing it out and, and it's fulfilling its purpose. But the seed likes being in the bag. And the, so the seed kind of goes into the bag and it kind of works its way down. And every time that the whole bunch of seed moves, it, it moves down into a, it, 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 it somehow hooked itself to one of the threads and ooh, it's pulled out. No, sir, I got myself saved that time because I am a mature seed. I have gone through the process of, of, uh, of, be, of growing up and, and I've gone through the, pro through the process of being dried out and I've gone through the process of, of uh, being harvested before. I'm one of those. I know all about that. I've been in the church for a long time. I was attached to a solid stock of someone else's faith for a long time. I matured and there was water, there was sun, there was, there was climate and humidity around me and, it, and someone else had all the control for a long time. And what do you mean disturbing now my comfort? I just want to stay in the bag. I just want to stay in the granary. I just want to stay here with my friends. Don't throw me out into the cold world where Jesus here says, he says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will remain alone. I don't like the sound of that. 
I, I like the sound of us all getting together. You know, I, I, I like when we sing nice, nice choruses. It is well with my soul. Hey, I like that. I like that. You like that, Karen? It's well with my soul. I, you know, I, 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 like, I like my music. I listen to all music. But when we're all together and everybody's singing, it's great. And we're all in the bag together. And we're all there and we're all comfortable and, and it's not too hot, it's not too cold. I had a shower, you know, before I came to church. I don't want to sit beside somebody, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's, it's, it's nice. We, we, we get together and we're comfortable and we're here and, and, and this, is, this is it. But Jesus says, wait a minute. Time to get out of the bag. Death. What does that mean? Death. As they're praying about that, he's, he's talking here that there's, there's two things that happen. There's the idea of a seed remaining alone and not fulfilling its purpose in its aloneness. Not fulfilling its purpose. What do you, you mean the seed has a purpose? <clears throat> when we lived in Alberta, we lived in a grain field. Literally, there was a grain field all around us. The guy's name was Ken Nelson, who owned the farm over, and he had these monster combines. He had three of the biggest machines I've ever seen in my life. He farmed like, I don't know, two or 3,000 acres of grain and canola and stuff. And, and so I, I watched him through the process, and, uh, and we only had trees to the north of us, but everything to the south of us, that should be a song, everything to the south of us, no, to the north of us. But everything, no, clowns to the right and jokers to the left. <laughs> that's the, never mind, that's politics again, isn't it? <clears throat> Took you a while to get that, didn't it? So, so I, I watched the process of this, you know? And I, and I watched the process of, of how Ken would, would, uh, he would, he would come along with this thing that tore up all the ground. Was that a plow, I guess? And then there'd be harrows, discs. This stuff would all smash it down. It was like heavy black mud was what it was. <clears throat> then he'd come through and he'd seed it all with oats or wheat or something. And I thought to myself, I remember thinking, I looked, looked out our sunroom window there one day, and I, I remember thinking to myself, there now, that seed that just got planted is fulfilling its purpose. That seed began to grow. It came up, little green shoot, a couple little leaves. I couldn't tell it for that from grass and and anything, but you know, people who know those things know, and that seed got a stalk, and it grew taller, and grew taller, about grew about that tall, and you know, and there was a, there was a head come out on it, there, it went through the milk stage, you know what the milk stage is, milk stage is when you take the kernels, and you crush them, and they're wet, and it comes out like milk, you know, juicy kernels, and then they, then they go, then they go from, from uh, green, they start turning a little yellow, then they, all the fields go golden, you know, then it comes time that it's going to be harvest, and so as, as I thought that, I thought, you know, so so that stalk then is that root system is supporting the head that's up on top. And so as I was trying to get my head around this business, <clears throat> what Jesus said, he said, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. So then, then I thought, well, okay, so that, that seed that drops in there, the point of that is so that there will be more seeds up top. So that seed in the ground gives its life for these seeds up top. And it provides the nurture, it provides the moisture, it provides the nutrients, it holds it up to the sun, it keeps it strong in the wind and the waves. That one seed there provides strength and life for these seeds up here as they mature. And then the Lord said this, Mark, who's on the top of your stock? So I'm going to ask you, who's on the top of your stock? Who are you helping to mature? Who are you holding up in prayer? Who are you feeding life-giving grace, forgiveness to? Who's on the top of your stock? The seed that you were is in the ground, or it's not. The gospel has taken root and it's growing something and, and through your life, you're, you're helping these people at the top of the stock to mature. So who are they? Who are you mentoring? Who are you praying for? Who are you sharing the gospel of the kingdom with? 
Who's on the top of your stock? You know, you can adopt people in. They don't have to be born into your stock. Sometimes to fall into the ground means there's a death to pride, a death to fear, a death to an old way of life, a death to control, a death to our own plans, a death to you fill in the blanks. And then we begin to grow. So coming back to Matthew chapter 9, we have a better understanding then of the harvest. Jesus was going about the business of the kingdom. Jesus here was illustrating what it is to be a kingdom Christian. Remember, Remember he said in John 14, 15, 16, 17, in those chapters, multiple times, in the same way I was sent, I'm sending you. In the same way I was sent, I'm sending you. So Jesus was going about the business of the kingdom, and as he went, he was teaching in the synagogues, he was preaching the good news of the kingdom, he was healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, they troubled him, for he could see deep inside them And he saw them as they tried to make their own way. They were lost. He saw them, you know, in in all of their finery. And and there were Pharisees and there were Sadducees. There were rich people. There were poor people. And it didn't matter about money. It didn't matter who had it and who didn't. They just seemed to be wandering. And I just want to be happy. I just want to find out what life is about. I just want to know, is there any meaning to this existence that we live? I eat my Cheerios in the morning and I put on a splash of milk from some cow, some place that got pasteurized and homogenized and bottleized and plasticized and, and I'm, I'm trying to eat this as best as I can. I'm doing all that. I'm just, is that what it is? I have a, have a bite to eat for supper, a little hamburger or a hot dog, you know, and I hope that, that I can go to bed without getting sick of that prefabricated, shoved in a sausage kind of a thing, little hot dog thing between white bread that's going to kill me eventually with cancer. They say, I don't know. What's the meaning of life? You never asked yourself that question? This is what Jesus saw. Wandering people. What's the meaning of life? So he, he, he went around to them. <clears throat> and it says he was teaching in their synagogues. Okay, well, why was he teaching? That's, you know, we asked that question. Why was he teaching? Uh, He was teaching because they wanted to know something. Someone asked a question, right? I I mean, I could could ask John. Can I ask you a question? How come you're so good looking? What? What? Nothing. I, I, I could, if I asked you a question, you would tell me an answer, wouldn't you? If you knew it, you would teach me. Would you teach me your trade? You would because you are knowledgeable. You have experience. So when Jesus was teaching here, people were asking questions. So it stands in my mind then as he was going there, it also says preaching the good news. So he was saying to them, and he wasn't necessarily in a church preaching or or wherever, but but he was maybe out on a lobster boat, Joseph. Maybe he had a Mustang. And he'd get to a car show, and you you, you saw another little Audi there, a TT something or other, a a triple turbo or something, whatever TT stands for. And, and, And there, you know, there's a conversation happens and someone else comes up, and you begin to talk about the stuff of the kingdom. That's preaching. And they ask a question, well, what do you mean the stuff of the kingdom? What do you mean about life? And and then you begin to teach. That's preaching and teaching. And then he said, you want to know something else? The spirit is so great. I, I know that you are sick. Can I pray for you? Now, <clears throat> now, you know, Jesus, as he as he healed people, because it, it, it came down here, you know, you, you, can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do one without doing what, the, what it says. It says, he's, he, t- he taught, he preached, he healed. Right, are you going to leave one of them out? Because we don't have that anointing? If you don't, you need anointing of the Holy Spirit, because it does come with it. You have an anointing for teaching, you have an anointing for preaching, And you can have anointing for the works of the Spirit as well. As God 
spirit settles in. It's interesting, you know, because as you, as you move in, into the kingdom, <clears throat> and I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again for clarity. <clears throat> people, people ask me to pray that they'd be healed. And you know what I do? You know what I do? I don't, I don't say, Lord, heal them. I say, Lord, do you want to heal them today? And if he says yes, I said, okay, Lord, what do you want to heal? What, what's the plan? Because a lot of times what people want to be healed for is not what the problem is. And people sometimes say, well, God's going to heal everybody. So they pray, you know, Lord, heal them of this, that, and something else. And th that's not the issue. The issue is something deep down buried inside. But my point in, in that is this, that living in the kingdom, there's secrets that are revealed to you about the kingdom. Jesus said that. There's an understanding of life. It's like when Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3, remember that? And he said, Lord, we know that you are a man come from God, for no one could do these things except that God be with him. And Jesus, right away, he didn't answer that question, didn't say, oh, that's very nice. He, he, what he said was this. He said, you cannot, what? See the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And then he went on, he said, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born or baptized of water and the spirit. He said, you can't see it, nor can you enter it unless those things happen. There, there is that whole thing that goes with it. So Jesus here, he, was, he went through the, the towns, the villages, he taught, he preached, he healed. But even more than that, he saw. He taught, he preached, he healed, but he saw... He saw the hearts of the people. He saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were harassed. They were helpless and they are wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. And so he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, it's plentiful, but the workers, where, where are they again? The workers are so few. Anybody know how many times Jesus asked us to pray? Anybody know that? The, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven. And that could work. When else did he? When Gethsemane? He said, you know, can you stay and pray with me for a little while? But, but how many times did Jesus ask you through the word, to pray for something. Anybody know? I think once. Yeah, right here. This is, this is the only time I can find. Now, if you know it, tell me afterwards. Don't tell me now, because that embarrass me. No, I wouldn't. But, it... <clears throat> but this is the only time I believe Jesus asked his followers to pray for something. He said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. It's important what he said. He said, uh, who to pray to, the Lord of the harvest, which would be God, about workers going out into the harvest field, which probably is us, and the location, his harvest field, not our harvest field, not where we think it should be. Lord, where do you want me to go today? Lord, where is the fruit ready to be picked today? People, people sometimes say, you know, you always just pick the low-hanging fruit. Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, they do. It's easiest, it's ripest, and it's ready. Why would you not? And God knows that, and he said, this is the place in my harvest field. This fruit is so ripe right now, I need someone there to catch it. It's dropping off the trees. People are wondering, you know, about the meaning of life in this age that we live in, in all the chaos and trauma and trouble. This is that time. Pray then. Ask God to send out workers into what part of the field? Into his harvest field. But be careful. Because you might be like Isaiah. 
when he heard God say, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And he said, what? Here I am, Lord. Send me. Well, some plant, Paul writes, some water and some harvest. The time of the harvest has come. The time of the kingdom is now. Uh, Jesus, when he, you know, in, in one of the other gospels relating directly to this, he sent out the 70, the 72, I think it was, wasn't it? He sent out the, the 70 to do all this, to preach the gospel and all that and, and, um, <clears throat> and do everything that they needed to do. And, and he said, this is the message. The kingdom of God has come near to you in this moment. You see, you who have accepted Christ into your life, that he does what he does and he takes away our shame and our guilt and our sin. You who have accepted Christ, the kingdom is within you. And when you go near to people and you pray with them, you access the, the heavenlies through you to them. God hears your prayers and he answers that even in that moment. The kingdom of heaven comes near the world through you. That's how you reap the harvest. So I'm going to say it one last time. Who's on the top of your stock? Who are you accountable to and who is accountable to you? Who do you ask week by week? Have you talked to anybody about Jesus Christ this week? Have you shared your testimony? You know, a lot, of, a lot of times we say, well, I don't know what that means, man. You go up there and, you know, and you got to preach a sermon. No, you, you don't, you know. You know, Jesus said, and with this I'm going to close. He said, um, he said there in, in Acts, you remember that in Acts chapter 1? He said, I, I've got something, I've got a gift for you. I want to I give you this. It's the promise that the Father had said you should have. He said, I want you to wait right here in Jerusalem until this promise comes to you. Because when this promise comes to you, you will receive power. And with this power, you then will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to all the world. It's not the power to preach a sermon. It's not the power to lead a church. Although there is that for those who are, are, are called to that. What it is the power of is to form your own testimony. This is my witness. I'm a witness of Jesus because once I was lost, now I'm not. How he did that, I don't know. What I did was I asked him into my heart and he did something inside me that made me feel a whole lot better and I wanted more of it. Got my Bible, I began to read it. I said, Lord, are you real? Are you really up there? If you're really up there, show me something in the word. Bible flops open. There's a verse and he's talking to me through it. And after a while, I begin to hear his voice. And I, and I don't hear it here, but I hear it in my heart. I perceive and I understand. And we, we grow in this. See, that's the stuff of the kingdom. That's your testimony. It doesn't have to be Paul's testimony you're talking about. It doesn't have to be Mark's testimony you're talking about. It doesn't have to be Ruth's testimony you're talking about. Oh, there's somebody in our church. You should talk to them because they got this great testimony. No, it's your testimony. That's what brings in the harvest. Your testimony of your journey to this point in time. Once I was a wandering sheep and Jesus came by and said, you got no home? I've got a place with a lot of other really good sheep. Come follow me and I will make you something that you can't be without me. Well, the harvest is great but there's a need for a whole lot more laborers in that harvest field. Let's pray.